You won't believe the incredible journey of Tony Chamberlain from humble beginnings in Canberra, Australia to leading major companies and turning them around. CEO is a really lonely job. You, you might have a board that you're working with, you might have a leadership team that you're working with. You don't really have a safe place. Whenever it comes to parting ways with an employee, I always think back to that time when I made a knee-jerk reaction and I was wrong. I shouldn't. South Korea is only 40 million people. Right, but their government's got behind these businesses and these are global entities that are doing brilliantly. Do we really understand how the Asian people think and feel or we don't really care? Many a politician that said, you know, we should be the food bowl for Asia. We should be looking at pumping water into the center of the country and, and growing crops and fertilizing that land and, and supplying Asia with the food. Hey, stand for something, have a crack. I, in my brain, I know that if we don't let people go, we're going to lose everything. Welcome back to the Brain Splat Podcast. I'm your host, Roland Leyun, and today we have an extraordinary guest with us, Tony Chamberlain. Tony's story is one of resilience, determination, and exceptional leadership. Get ready to be inspired. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you on board. Your story is one of its kind. I only had um, a successful business and suddenly it went bankrupted. It impacted you dramatically at the early stage of your life. What can you tell us about this phase? What happened was my, my father had actually come to Australia, but Anthony Hordens had brought him out to Australia to run part of their business. And he was very successful here in Sydney. He then opened his own business in Canberra, and it was a thriving business, apparently. But in the late 1950s, there was a recession in Australia, and um, he lost everything. They lost mm -hmm. everything. And I was born, because quite interesting in my family, because my elder brothers and sisters, private school, chauffeur driven to school, all that sort of thing. And then I was born and um, they lost everything and we're living in housing commissions. From luxury to housing commission. Yeah, yeah. Straight away. Straight away, bang. Lost everything. How did your family handle this? I think my mother was the tough one. She held it all together. Um, you know, I had uh, an elder sister, two older brothers. They went through the transition. I mm. suppose by the time I was born, it had, all the dust had settled. And, you know, my early memories were... Life was normal. So you were born in the Housing Commission? I was born in the Housing Commission, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And what was the experience? Do you remember anything about the Housing Commission life? Oh, hey, it was, it was a, gr a great experience. A great experience. We, um, you know, had a wood fire in the, in the lounge room. That was the sole heating for the whole house. We'd go collecting wood and doing all those sorts of things. We'd grow vegetables in the backyard, you know, in the gardens in the backyard. Um, that was normal. It was great. It was a wonderful childhood. It's always, amazing how you still hold the memories of this. Yeah. Always had a, oh, you know, always had pets. I had a dog and all oh, that nice. stuff. So, yeah, no, nothing. It was fine. I didn't know any different. Excellent. Excellent. Did not know any different. But what about school wise? Pro, uh, public school. Public school. Public school. And, um, and hey, oh, in Canberra, the schools are really high standard. Really high standard. So I was thinking about, it's funny you asked me that question because I was thinking about that the other day and I was thinking, you know, one of the great things about the public primary school I went to was it was in an area called Red Hill, which is a good area in Canberra. Mm -hmm. Um, and we used to get a lot of children of people that were working in the embassies. So you'd meet Russians, you'd meet people, people from Brazil, you'd have all these friends from all over the world. Different cultures. Different cultures. Oh, pretty good. And I was a pretty friendly kid, so you become friendly with all of them. Did you grab any languages of them? Or no, I didn't really? grab any <laughs> languages, but just their way of thinking. And, you know, of course, because I was a little fatty, I used to love all the food, you know. Like, I can remember one kid I had, his, Rahul Ray, his name was, and his mother was the most amazing cook. And they'd have... Um, They'd have occasions. By the way, sorry, he's not fat at all. I did that. <laughs> <laughs> they'd have occasions where they'd invite people to their house. Yeah. And we'd go, you know, after school or whatever, and there were just 
so much food and it was just, you know, spicy food. It was wonderful, really wonderful experience. Wonderful experience. Everything was going well to some extent. And suddenly your eldest brother um, had a near fatal car accident. That yeah. He again, did. he did. Was impacted your life dramatically. Yeah, he did. He actually, before my brother's accident, my father had, um, he had bowel cancer. Oh. Um, I was in, I would have been in fourth class and he was in hospital for a long time with bowel cancer and he got over the bowel cancer and I remember him convalescing at home and he was much older. He was 60 when I was born. He was much older than me and I'm, I'm much older. And then he got well and then my brother John, when I was 12, had a massive car accident where his car hit a telegraph pole. Um, it was, it was really weird. Um, we were in Sydney on holidays from Canberra, my mother, my sister and I, and my mother and I were lying on the bed and we were watching traffic driving up and down the street. And mum said, get your clothes off. It, we, and we see this car coming, right? And mum says, put your clothes on, we're going out. And I sort of looked at her and said, I'm going to bed. And she said, no, 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 that car's bringing bad news. Get dressed. So we got dressed, knock on the door, and it was one of John's friends. And he said, John's, that John's my brother. John's been in a serious accident and you, you better come. Mm. And uh, I can remember it really well, you know, we went to Manly Hospital and the doctors were saying, you know, he's not going to make it. And my mum was saying, yes, he will. Yes, he will. She just wouldn't accept anything else. And um, he'd, he'd literally broken the bone in his neck that you break when you, when, when you get hung. And, the, you know, like they said, he's not going to make it. Anyway, that whole night, we were at Manly Hospital. Then he got transferred to Royal North Shore Hospital. And, and luckily, the, there was a professor at the Royal North Shore Hospital and they operated on him and they put, put his head in traction. Um, and he was on 18 mil of pine board with the sheet over it and 20 pound traction just holding it straight. Mm. And he couldn't move, couldn't move anything. And then like two weeks later, he could move his thumb like this. And the doctor said, well, that's pretty amazing. You know, all he could do is move his thumb. And when I go and visit him, I'd, you know, massage his hands and I'd talk to him. And he'd tell me how many holes there were in the ceiling above and how many holes there were in the whole ward that he was in. And he was just there doing mathematics in his head, keeping himself occupied. And he just worked and worked and worked. And to sort of jump to the, to the beginning of his recovery, I remember one Saturday morning, I, uh, I I was working, I think, and I came home early and there's a strange car in the driveway. And um, John, it's, as part of his rehabilitation, and he was in the hospital for like 18 months. He was in, he was in um, intensive care for, what, eight months or something. Um, but then he got transferred to rehabilitation and he learnt to drive a car with hand controls. Anyway, he bought a car. He got his license, and as a surprise, he drove from Sydney to Canberra to show us, hey, look at me, I'm, I'm up, and about, up and about. He's amazing. Oh, my God. He, this guy loved fishing. You know, if, if you went to his house and there was a canary in the cage in his lounge room, you go, oh, no, because you know what's going to happen? Next week there's going to be birds in the backyard, and before you know it, there's going to be thousands of birds and he did to his house in Wild Beach. He had a bird aviary with literally hundreds of birds in it. He had Indian ring net parrots and all these parrots, and he just loved these birds. You know, when he did something, he went all the way. He didn't just do this much. He starts, gets an interest in fishing. He's driving on four-wheel drive tracks in a Commodore and casting the line out the window in tracks down the snowy mountains fishing for trout, you know, like. He just never say die, this guy. What did you really feel when you saw your your brother laying down and you felt hopeless? You know, you couldn't change anything. You couldn't 
help him whatsoever. W- what was your feeling? What went through your head? You, I think you realise how frail, as a kid, I think you realise how frail life is and how bad things can happen really easily. Um, but probably more important than thinking about him lying down is watching him, his recovery and watching his will to survive come to the surface. You know, like, he was like my mum. He'd just never give in. Like, just no such thing as can't do. Mm. Um, he wouldn't let it. He wouldn't let it beat him. I actually remember... Uh, there was an art, there was a, you know, we were together, um, and there was a thing on TV about how they'd found ways to help quadriplegics move. I remember talking to him and I remember him saying to me, if they could cure my, um, quadriplegia, I wouldn't take the cure because I've spent so much time in the chair. I'm more used to being in a wheelchair than in walking around. Sadly. And to this day, I can't get my mind around that. You know, I just can't get my mind, but that's how he was. It was like, this is the way I am. I'm, I've got it. I'm, I've got it under control. I've spent more time in this chair than I've spent walking around. I'm, I'm happy. So obviously you had millions and millions of questions going through your head. You, we as humans, do you think we deserve to go through all of this or is this part of life? Well, I think it's part of life. I part think, of life. I think it happens. You know, I think bad things happen and you've got two choices collapse or make the best of it mm. yeah obviously your mum played a major role in your life and you haven't stopped talking about her really you've mentioned her so many times who is this lady she's an unbelievable lady she was um you know she held the whole family together when everything went bad she you know she went and spoke to politicians to get us into a house um she um was fierce protector of the family, um, and and she would drum into you, nothing's impossible. You can do it. Put your mind to it. Make it happen. You know, like she was very powerful woman. Very a real powerful. fighter. Real fighter. Never give in. Never give in. Mm. Um, what very, did you learn of her? Really, the spirit. You know, don't give spirit. in. Enjoy what you've got. Um, not about money. It's about people. It's about family. Um, enjoy the journey. She lived to 90, 93. Beautiful. Yeah. You still remember her very well, yeah? Oh, very well, very well. You know, like, it's funny. Um, I think of, um, yeah, I, you know, this is getting off the track, but you, you open the door these days for a lady to walk through. And one in 10 times, you're going to get abused. You know, somebody's going to say, hey, I can do that myself. I don't need you to open the door. And my reply is, hey, if I didn't open the door, I'd feel my mother's hand on the back of my head giving me a smack in the head oh. because it's the way to treat a lady is to be polite and let her go first. So, you know, a silly example. but Look, I think you should be proud of whatever you're doing because you're doing the right thing. Whether yeah. people accept it or not, that's how it is. Yeah, that's how it is. Yeah. 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 Life doesn't stop. You moved on. Um, one of the key turning points in your life, in your professional life, was James Hardy. Yeah. You went through James Hardy, John James Hardy, and implemented significant changes. And these changes led to remarkable, remarkable results. So my question to you, what strategies did you apply just to turn this business around? Do you know, the um, the best thing that happened in my professional career was joining James Hardy. Um, when I, I joined James Hardy, there was a managing director of James Hardy. His name was Dr. Keith Barton. And Dr. Barton, or Keith Barton, no, nobody called him Dr., everybody called him Keith. His view was that, the best way to get anything done was to use the power of your team. And he actually was instrumental in driving a program and it was called Working Together. And it was teaching managers how to work as a team, how to use teamwork, and you were given team tools, how to use teamwork to get the best solutions from your team, how to how to team data handle, how how to make sure that you gave everybody in your team uh, an opportunity to speak up, how 
a leader's role was to facilitate, not to tell people what to do. Um, and, you know, when I joined James Hardy, this program was just starting. And I, I don't even think I joined the company, but I remember going out to a um, conference centre out in Warwick Farm where we, were spent three, we spent three days being taught of how to work together. As leaders, this is how you work together. And, um, we, you know, when, when I went through that, and this is my first chance in joining, this is a company that's turning over $1.5 billion. Um, you know, I've always been in, up until this time, I'd always been in small businesses. And I'm thinking, yeah, corporate Australia, you know, like this is one of Australia's blue chip stocks. So I've got to take note. I've got to learn. I've got to understand. I've got to make sure that I work within the way this company is to work. And um, I... I ate it up with a spoon. I loved it. I loved. I loved the way. It, I loved the the way you were taught. I loved the way you were treated. I loved the way that that people within in the business were treated as individuals and respected. Um, and we got amazing results in the pipelines business, in the in the, in the bathroom products business. I was really funny, right? We we worked and we'd made a big difference in this in the bathroom products business and uh, I got called into head office to see Keith and I'd known him because he'd come out and visit you know he, this is somebody that was pretty well he was quite present in the business and he says Tony and he's sort of a little bit rough the way he'd speak but Tony um, you've done a good job out at bathroom products um, let me introduce you to Michael Michael's working with UBS and uh, we're going to sell the business. Mate, it's going to look great on your CV. Oh See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Bang. Um, and this is James Hardy where James Hardy were coming down to focus on fibre cement because it was such a great product. It, it, it was a designer product. And they had all these other businesses that they, had, that they sold off. Anyway. Uh, we worked for two years or something to sell that business. We sold the business. Company was happy. Everybody was really happy. But to this day, when I'm working in a team, I still apply the principles from working together that I was taught in James Hardy. So, so what are these principles? Um, well, there were set ways of of um, you know working as a team to to gather data. Mm -hmm. Um, there were set ways that once you decided on a project, you'd write what you call a pre-critique, which is really a plan for your project. You know, you'd identify, you know, what the issue was. You'd identify why it was an issue. Then you'd identify the key steps in solving the problem. Uh, still do it now. Still do it. Done it in every business I've been in where we have something that's significant within the business. I make sure we write a pre-critique and we know what we're doing. The team knows what we're doing. Some of along the way, you know, some people used to think I was crazy because I was so focused on getting this stuff right, but it worked. Really, really good way of doing it. Good. I'm glad it did work. From my personal experience, there's all kind of leaders. Uh, the most important leaders are leaders who make decisions in their life. So obviously throughout your career, you've made numerous decisions and these decisions didn't only impact you as a person, but also impacted your employees. Big time, yeah. Can you share some of those major decisions that you made and how it did impact you personally? What had an impact on your employees too? Like critical decisions. Yeah, yeah. Look, there's, there's been, throughout my, you know, my time as CEOs, there's been literally hundreds of major decisions. You know, it's, it, it's weird, but it's turned out that a lot of the businesses that I've gone into, uh, over time have been underperforming businesses or have had major glitches. Um, you know, I could go back to Chum Fire, um, that, that if you looked at that business, it was a culmination of four acquisitions, major acquisitions that created the business. And when you got into the business, everybody was working against each other. You know, they weren't working as a team. It wasn't coherent. It wasn't one. And 
you know, it became very obvious that, hey, we've got to create one team, we've got to create one way of doing things. And, and when you do those things, people are impacted. You know, unfortunately, sometimes people lose their jobs because you've got duplicates and you've got to choose the best person. And so many people get affected. And my rule has always been treat everyone with respect. You know, that's not their fault that, that there's not a job for them, but treat them the way you want to be treated. And, you know, the, the thing that, uh, that sticks in my mind in many of the jobs, many of the companies that I've worked for is when you leave, people tell you the truth. And, and they really tell you the truth. They really tell you the truth, right? And in a lot of those companies, and I kept some of the emails, mm. you get emails from people, and I can think of, you know, the company I just left where the note was, Tony, you when you came in, we all thought you were a bastard, but you certainly pointed us in the right direction. And on behalf of my family, I want to thank you for saving my job. That's beautiful. Because I had many conversations with my wife, and this is the only industry I knew, and I was really worried, but you saved us. Now, it wasn't me. It was the team that saved everyone. But it makes you feel like, hey, I really did something there. You know, I really did something. Mm. So if you want to make a decision, normally you would, as a leader, you would have a style. What I classify by style is in which area do you actually work in? Do you work in the black and white uh, decision-making style or you prefer to stay in the gray area? What is your decision-making style? You know, I think in decision-making these days, you start in the gray area. You know, like it's nothing's, nothing's 100% certain. And... People say, oh, you can run the numbers and the numbers will tell you what to do. No, the numbers will tell you part of it because you're dealing with people, markets, competitors. There's so many areas of grey. And the best decisions that I've ever made, are, I usually share them with my team, right? So COVID, use COVID as an example. Uh, in the business I was in, our revenue just about went to zero. As soon as COVID struck, we couldn't we couldn't run any events. There's no there was just no revenue. So which business was that? That was Encore. Encore, Encore Technologies. So what did we do? So we got the, the top team together. Here's the problem. And right, we're right at the beginning of COVID. And we don't know. We didn't know that this thing was going to go for 18 months. You know, we're thinking, hey, it's going to go for two months. Mm. Um, so we're planning out what are we going to do? And I might have an idea and I throw it in the middle of the table and it gets discussed with the team. The team's got different ideas and we might stay in that room for two hours debating and then we've got to make a decision. And sometimes I pick up the mantle and say, we're going to go that way. Other times we let the debate go and we bring the team back again and have another crack at it. Um, but generally... We make decisions in the grey and we and we use the power of the leadership team that's running the business to decide what we're going to do. Hmm. Well, when you say we, um, isn't that isn't that it will, it will always be your fi your final decision? You decide at the end. So do you gather information from your team members and then you decide or we gather how does it work? We generally gather information and we decide. And, and yeah, absolutely. There'll be times when, if you look at COVID, that was tough because we were going to have to drop, let people go. And the people around the table, they don't want to do that. They don't want to be responsible for that. But my, in my brain, I know that if we don't let people go, we're going to lose everything. So you've got to, you've got to make that decision. Um, so yeah, I take responsibility. Mm, that's good. Well, we all live in Australia. It's a small island in the middle of nowhere, and business life is completely different from everywhere around the world. So it does come with a lot of challenges, being as an Australian company. Can you name some of the, these challenges, and how do you face them? You know, from the time um, I was... Uh, uh, a general manager of a manufacturing business in my late 20s. 
I remember my first trip to America and I remember going and we were manufacturing ice makers, post mix equipment. And I remember going to some of these big American factories and I used to look at their product. Their product was nowhere near as good as our product. And I used to think to myself, what's going on here? These guys, they're 10 times bigger than me. They've got, you know, they've got massive market power, but their product's not as good as mine. And the answer in my head was volume. You know, a lot of, uh, country, a lot of people or businesses that operate in larger markets have a great opportunity because they've got volume. In Australia, we don't have that volume. So I've got to be smart in terms of what we do. Um, and we're very innovative. Um, and you can't just pick up our product and dump it in an American market and think it's going to work because it's hard work. You know, it's really hard work. So, you know, it's a bit of a long winded answer to your question, but one, I thank my lucky stars I was born in Australia. Hey, where it's the luckiest country in the world. There's differences, but um we respect difference. We've got yep. many different cultures, many different people. I love all those things about our, our 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 country. Okay, so volume's not so big. That's the way it is. Um cut the cloth to suit what we've got. Mm. Um, there's been a number of Australian companies that have done brilliantly overseas. James Hardy is a perfect example. Focused on one product, took it to the US, and, you know, it's it's a powerhouse. Um, so why don't we actually duplicate this and then um, recreate, recreate whatever James Hardy has done? I think James Hardy is a great example. Um, just to make it, the conversation more... Um, conf- uh, confusing go to korea south korea um lg um kia hyundai um you think of the samsung these massive companies korea is only 40 million south korea is only 40 million people right but their governments got behind these businesses and these are global entities that are doing brilliantly uh when i listen to so where is our government here that's exactly where I was. I was going to. I was trying to think how I could be respectful, but when I listen to our government, you know, talking about the weeds, um, you know, we need, we need the uh, some of these big industries really need support. James Hardy did it all on their own. They didn't get any government support. Mm. Um, but these companies are these countries are really smart because they know that it's great for the country. It's a good life in South Korea. You know, it's a very it's a thriving economy. Um, and it's got some, you know, some beautiful businesses. It's funny because that leads me to my next question, which is really interrelated. Uh, politics plays a major role in Australia, um, and it does really impact businesses, major businesses. How much politics play um, a negative role or a positive role on Australian businesses, and how can we improve that? Mm. In terms of politics, right, and and if you if you look back to great political leaders that we have, you go back to Bob Hawke, John Howard, Paul Keating. You go back many years, right, and these guys stood for something. They had a vision. Um, you know, John Howard was all about getting the GST in. Keating was about the four banks policy. Hawke was about stopping all the strikes and creating consensus and, and getting us, you know, focusing on, on work. And I haven't done any of those leaders justice in my examples. You come forward and look at today's leaders. And I think today's leaders are hampered by social media and what they say is public, publicized like that. Uh, so every P and Q, they're trying to be politically correct and keep everybody happy. I don't think they stand for enough. I mean, you look at... But can you lead the country if you want to keep everyone happy or you have to make decisions? I think you have to end. make decisions and drive it yeah. and drive it, you know. And um, people, I think the politicians of today get pulled around by this, the special interest groups and they're more focused on those than really the greater majority. And I never want to be a politician because I think I'd be terrible at it because I, you know, I'd, I'd have a view and, and that's where I'd want to go. And I, I wouldn't be polite to some of the smaller groups. Mm. But 
don't you think that uh, they are obliged to do something about this country, like for this country? I think we've got we've got the luckiest country in the world, and um, we need to be looking twenty years out and saying what are the things that we're going to do. You know, I can remember many a politician that said, you know, we should be the food bowl for Asia. We should be looking at pumping water into the centre of the country and and growing crops and fertilising that land and and supplying Asia with the food. Hey, stand for something. Have a crack. Um, but what, what's the, 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 the only one thing that I can think of in the last decade that's been put up is the nuclear plants as an alternative to solar. Yeah. And there's a huge debate on this. There's, now. A, there's a huge yeah. debate, um, and I don't know what's right or what's wrong. But hey, at least they're standing for something and putting up an alternative. You know, that's I think that's healthy. But let's do it more on helping our economic strength. You mentioned Asia, and obviously Asia plays a major role also in Australia, specifically. But are we doing enough just to build this strong relationship with Asia, or do we need a strong relationship with Asia? Yeah, I think we're part of Asia and I think we absolutely need a strong relationship with Asia. And uh, if you look at the damage we did to our own economy with our the tussle that we had with China, you know, lobsters and, and wine and all things being banned from China's side. And I'm not saying China were right or wrong. Um, I'm saying that you could see how easily a superpower could affect our economy, affect and affect key segments of industry within the business. We are part of Asia and uh, we need to respect uh, that we are part of Asia and work more. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful market. Look at, look at the population in, in some of these countries. It's a great opportunity for us. Do you think we understand Asia enough as no, people? As... No, I don't think so. No. No, I don't think so. Because I think we've, as as a country, I think we've aligned ourselves with the US and the UK, um, which is all well and good. But hey, we're, look at look at the proximity. Look at our who's look at our nearest neighbours. You know, mm. <laughs> it's Asia. It is Asia. <laughs> yeah, it is Asia. Do you think uh, also like because we focus on maybe just, we're providing education to a lot of Asian countries, which is really good. Tourism is really good also. Uh, but do we really understand how the Asian people think and feel or we don't really care? Because based on that, you build a business and your business will progress in Asia. Yeah. Instead of just treating them as a, as a market and then we put something on the shelf and they should buy it off us. You know, it comes back to respecting the difference. And, and in my last company, we built a network of, of, um, branches across Asia and um, you really had to understand the culture and and when I talk about the culture I'm talking about just the business culture in terms of dealing with people and doing business with them it's different to the way you do business here so I think you're very arrogant if you think this is how I do it in Sydney and it's going to work in Singapore it's going to work in Thailand or it's you no know, it's it doesn't work that way. So you, you really have to customize it. You've got to understand. You've got to respect. You've got to respect the difference. Mm. So going back to Australia, you as a leader, um, you have a lot of skills and you gain a lot of skill through your career. You're looking now at the young leadership um, in Australia. What can you see the advantages and disadvantages in those young leaders leaders in Australia? And if you look at um, you look at where we are today as a as a economy as a business, and you look at the speed of change, and the speed of change today is as slow as it's ever going to be. It's only ever going to improve Excel, yeah. and and increase. And if you look at uh, young leaders, you look at the tools that they've got. You know, AI. Amazing. <laughs> AI is a perfect example. Um, and it's understand how you use that and how you go forward. So, hey, I don't, they, I, I don't know that there's any great difference between younger leaders of today and younger leaders of, of the past, except for the tools that are available, available to them and the key principles in terms of leading people and treating people with respect and getting people to buy in. And I think it's a bit harder today where... People are working from home, 
So, you know, once upon a time you could build a culture and everybody was under one roof. It's not like that today. So that's, that's more of a challenge. Um, you know, one of the things I'm doing is, uh, I work with tech and Vistage. I'm a, I'm a chair. And in, in tech, we, we recruit CEOs and as, as members. We meet once a month. We bring in, uh, guest speakers and we have access to about 300 guest speakers. Um, those guest speakers come in and educate us. And I tell you what, it's wonderful to watch the leaders, the members get hold of this three hour education session and look at how they're going to apply it to their business. Look at how they process the education part, ask the questions they ask and, and, um, then how they, how they're going to take it away and apply it. I, it's, it's wonder, it's tr a truly wonderful thing to be a part of. Um, and I look at these guys and I think, hey, we're in good hands. You know, we've got some wonderful people take us forward. So you mentioned education and education also plays a major role in the structure of any society. So are you saying that education in Australia is at a good standard? Is this what you think it is now or it can be improved? Oh, look, I think everything can be improved, but I'm, I don't think I'm in a place to talk about how it compares to the rest of the world. I think, um, you know, edu I think, uh, you know, primary school, high school, and then university, that's, that's pretty well a set path. And I don't think it stops at the end of university. You know, you're learning all the time. Like I'm learning. I, before I came here, it doesn't, it doesn't I, stop. <laughs> I, I, spent, I spent an hour and a half on, on, uh, learning to be a, a, a better leader, learning to be a better coach. Um, learning to, to, to work with people and, and help be a better, um. So what makes a better leader or better coach? Mm, that's a, that's a toughie. What makes a better leader? So what, you should have a point of, uh, differentiation between Tony Chamberlain and everyone else. And so what is this key? Yeah. Differentiator. I don't know what the key differentiator is, but I know, I certainly know that, you know, as a, um, as a mentor or doing one to ones with members, um, you know, it's all about helping them grow, grow their business, grow as a person, improve. And I think there's a real art to helping somebody grow because you're not going to sit there and say, well, I did this and you should do this and you should do that. It's about, being curious, it's about working with somebody to ask the right questions, to help them understand what it is they want to do. You know what, they, they say that if you tell somebody what to do, there's about a 10% chance that it's going to happen. But if you ask somebody the right questions and they can see what they want to do, there's a 70% chance of success. So... I'm still, I'm still perfecting the art of, of, you know, being a good coach. Um, and it's something that I think I'm going to be working at for quite a few years to just keep improving. You only need to improve that much each day and you can go this far very quickly. hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Look, brains plot normally in brains plot, what we do, we talk about technology and the impact it has on people. And this is the reason we created this venture just to make sure that we actually collect all of this information and people can always reference to it. Technology plays a major role in businesses. Um, recently we had AI, we have cybersecurity, which is like major threat to every single business in Australia. What is your view on cybersecurity and AI in general? It doesn't have to be specific, yeah. but from a, a leadership, from a CEO, from a business, yeah, man. So start with cybersecurity. Um, and in terms of securing your business, it's a res responsibility of the leadership of the organization, right? It's not something that gets delegated to the, the CIO or somebody else. Leadership has to take responsibility for it. And if you look at the breakdowns in, in terms of, uh, cybersecurity, it generally comes from an employee, right? Somebody clicks on a link um, and you've got hell to pay. 
So it's education. It's making sure people understand their responsibility. You know, obviously there's, there's all the things that you need to do to make sure your systems are safe and people can't hack. But, you know, the, the pointy end of cybersecurity is the culture of the business. Um, and making sure people understand their role. And generally, um, I was in a, an Australian company and we sold to an American company. And they came in to beef up and check out our systems. And they said, the day that you're owned by an American company, your strikes, the strikes, the hacks, the attempted break-ins to your system will increase threefold. Well, they were actually wrong. Mm. They increased by four and a half times um, from being an Aussie company to being owned by an American company. 457% was the, was the number of increased attempts to get into our system. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So um, the board leadership's total responsibility uh, is cybersecurity. So there's a very untechnical answer, but that's that's my view. In terms of AI, AI is a bit like the Industrial Revolution, right? We can be Luddites and try and push it over there and use all the excuses for it not to work, or we can embrace it and understand it and in tech, we've had a number of people come in and educate us on the opportunities in AI. And the message is, if you're not using AI within your business, you're going to fall behind 100%. because your competitors are going to pick it up. And they're going to, I, I mean, I look at, I look at myself and how I use AI and man, it's improved my productivity brilliantly. So if you're, if you're in a business and you're using it properly and you've got the right controls and you've educated your team and you've got the right culture, and you're going to you're going to jump ahead like nobody's business. So where would, where would Tony be if he had all these AI capabilities years ago? Where where would Tony be now? Mm, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm happy where I am right now. I'm mm -hmm. happy where I am, I, and I'd love to go back and do it all again. Um, cause it'd be, I do many would things. Would you do it differently or yeah, would yeah, you yeah, do it exactly yeah, the same? No, many mistakes I've made along the way, right? Many things, many wrong decisions made, made lots of errors. Um, but luckily the right decisions have been much bigger than the wrong decisions. But if you can get rid of those wrong decisions, the right comes better. Um, understanding people, understanding the importance of leadership. There's so many things that you know now that you wish you knew yeah, when you started. So, yeah, no, I'd, I'd love to do it again. This is one question that I never thought about, but I'm going to ask you and just put you on the spot. Um, you've been a CEO and you've led many companies. When you stand in front of your mirror, would you consider yourself to be successful? in what you have done and what you have achieved and how can we measure success? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I've achieved what I want to achieve yet. I still got plenty of time and in my current role uh, as a chair of tech, I want to be the best chair I can possibly be. And that's a big ask because I've met some of the other chairs in tech and these people are awesome, absolutely awesome. So I'm going to work my craft and I'm going to be the best I possibly can be. And what does that mean? Well, if I'm the best I can be, I'm working with, right now I'm working with 12, but in the future I'm probably working with 24 or 36 CEOs, leaders of business. I'm going to impact those guys and they're going to be the best they can be. And that's going to have a huge impact on our country, you know, um, or, or on our state or on our, on, or within those businesses, you know, if you want to boil it down. So I still have a lot to do, a lot to achieve. Uh, so I have, I'm not saying I'm successful now. How do you feel? How do you, how can you measure success? Is it from your, how much you made in your bank or what, what is your, what is your impact really on society? Uh, my, well, I think one of my challenges is I've never really cared about money. I don't care about finances, um, personal finances. Um, you know, you, you, when you uh, first start at uni, you taught about, you know, um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, food, shelter, self-actualization. I think... Uh, 
putting back in, helping the people around you. Um, if you lift them up, they're going to help lift you up. You know, it, it's it's uh, it's pretty simple. You reap what you sow. Mm. What is your advice to the young generation? People are now watching you, and they've seen seen this successful businessman in front of them. What is your advice to them? First piece of advice is enjoy what you're doing. Work out exactly what you want to achieve and go for it. Um, just don't, don't, uh, don't let the naysayers hold you down. You know, uh, uh, just, just go for it. Make up your mind and do it. And if you put your mind to it, you put your effort to it, you will do it. And along the way, you fall over many times. Oh, it's nothing. Every time you fall over, you've learned a lesson. Stand up, dust yourself off, and go again. Um, Can they do it on their own, or they need someone to sponsor them and support them? See, I don't think I don't think you can do. I think you can do things on your own, definitely. Um, but if I look, I look at my current role, tech, right? People say to me, "Oh, great! You've done a fantastic job building the team." I say, "Yeah, yeah that's fine, but it's not me." You know, like there's a whole lot of people behind me. There's people that are training me to 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 be a better chair. There's people that are helping me with bringing members on board. There's people that are helping me in terms of coaching and mentoring. There's lots of people that are helping you, and you've got to respect that they're helping you and um, use that help because people want to help each other. You know, it's what you give, you receive. Mm. Um, so, you know, I'm sorry if you're using tech as an example. Is that because it's current? No, but I would, I would love to hear more about tech. So we're going to do a small recording at the end so okay. that you can tell our viewers on what is tech. Sure, and sure how you can assist them with. Um, there's so many ways we can wrap up this discussion that I feel like I can talk to you for hours and hours and doesn't stop. But Tony Chamberlain, what do you regret most in your life so far? Do I regret most in my life? Oh, boy. Look, I've got many, many regrets. Some personal, uh, some, some in business. Um, it's really hard to say what I regret most, but you know what? I learned from my mistakes. My regrets come from my mistakes. I've got to look at it, say I made a mistake and move on. Um, it's a bit of a non-answer because it's hard to prioritize what my greatest regret is. Um, you know, I, I, can, I can remember in a business that I was in many years ago, we did a big acquisition in Western Australia. And we had a number of managers that were playing games over there. And I remember flying over to Western Australia and I was really upset with these managers and I fired a couple of them on the spot because they were they were playing games and I really regretted that. I that that's whenever it comes to parting ways with an employee, I always think back to that time when I made a knee-jerk reaction and I was wrong. I should not have I should not have done that. I regretted that so much. Um and I could still see the faces of of mm-hmm. those people. Um and you know you've got a lot of power um and you shouldn't use it like that. It's wrong. It's wrong to do that. Um that was a big lesson for me. Um yeah. If I did ask you this question years ago, would you accept that it was like a um a bad decision that you made or something that you, you regretted? I regretted that decision two weeks later. Two weeks later, I sat down and I thought about it and I thought, gee, you did the wrong thing there. You, you know, like, that was, that was wrong. You should not have done that. Excellent. Leaving this discussion on a very good note, what is the future for Tony Chamberlain? Um, the future for me is being the best chair I can be at Tech Stroke Vistage. We're just in the process of changing our name. But uh, it's it's something that I started in November of last year. Um, and, you know, they selected me to be a chair. They've given me lots of training. Um, I've got my first group that starts in August. Um, I've been recruiting uh, members for that group. Uh, and, and basically I'm looking for CEOs. Um, and in the group, 
we have we use the wisdom of the group to help each other solve problems, which is just it's called issue processing, and it's such a powerful tool. And you watch CEOs that have been CEOs for twenty years bring a problem to the table, put it in the middle of the table. We process the issue for that CEO. We give him him or her alternatives, and they say, "Man, that's amazing." It's we create an environment that's safe. You know, a CEO is a really lonely job. Uh, you know, you, you might have a board that you're working with. You might have a leadership team that you're working with. But you don't really have a safe place where you can bounce ideas without judgment, without fear of them leaking into the organisation. And tech stroke vistage creates that for CEOs. And being having the privilege to facilitate that and make that happen is is truly rewarding. It's truly rewarding. And then I get the privilege of learning when we bring a guest speaker in. Um, those guest speakers come in and they educate us on all sorts of things. And I've learned so much through the guest speakers that have come in. Um, it's, it's a really good experience. That's fantastic. Tony, one final thing for you. Um, personally, I'm, I think your kids are going to look at you down the track. They're going to watch this episode. They're going to see, they're going to be so proud of you, of what you have done in your life. And how you started from nowhere and you ended up wherever you are now. What do you actually say to your kids? Uh, what I say to my kids, to both my kids, is enjoy the journey. Um, treat people as you want to be treated. And um, and have fun. And it goes really quickly. You've got to be careful. <laughs> you blink your eye twice and 20 years has passed, you know. It goes so fast. So... I'm really proud of my kids right now. You know, like, they don't have to do anything. I, they're good humans. They respect people. They love what they do. So I'm good. Fantastic. Thank you, Sonny. Thanks a million. Excellent. Enjoyed it. I, from my first interaction with you, I, you were very open in terms of here's what I'm creating, this is what I'm doing, and this is where I'm going. So my opinion of brain splat is... You've got to keep doing what you're doing and you're, you're going to get success. And I think success is um, millions of viewers. It just, it just takes time. And some, somebody told me the other day, it's always darkest in the middle of the tunnel. Hey? You know, you're on your way out. So keep at it. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very challenging thing, the podcast world at the moment. And there's more and more podcasts. So Textra Vistage is a business that's been going for 40 years. They have more than 30,000 members across the globe. In Australia, it's been going for 30 years. The way it works is bringing together uh, CEOs who, who sign on as members. Uh, generally, there's uh, two hours of mentoring a month. There's a group meeting where we spend a day together. We bring subject matter experts in that will spend half a day with us. We have access to more than 350 subject matter experts. Um, we we solve we we are a safe place for CEOs. A C, being a CEO is a very lonely role, uh, and and we create an environment where CEOs with like minds get together, share ideas, share where they're going, share problems, and it's done in a safe environment, risk free, and people get a lot out of it. You leave that meeting. Looking forward to the next one. So it's 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 a wonderful thing. I wish I'd have found it much earlier. Excellent.